Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen here with Louis D'Souza and Amy Blackford. Today is Monday, September the 7th, 2020. That's Labor Day here in the U.S. It's 4 p.m. New York time and wherever you are in the world, thanks for joining us for another episode of LOA Today, your daily dose of happy. And uh, I get to start things off today, Amy, with an email for you from one of our listeners. All right, great. <laughs> this comes from Josie. She's actually one of our regular live streamers, too. And she says, hi, Amy, like you, I am a writer. I write poetry. In fact, she read some of her poetry on the show one time. Fantastic. Um, flash fiction and movie reviews. And I wanted to ask you, from your experience as a writer, how do you balance discipline and force? Discipline and what? Force. F-O-R-C-E. Okay, so... I'm Although she wrote to... Disciple and Force, but I think she meant Discipline. Okay, so Discipline and the Universal Force is what I'm I'm gathering from that. I, that's fine. Go go with what you <laughs> gather. When I read it, I gathered it as a, as being self-disciplined versus being forced to do something. But okay. re- read okay. it the way that makes sense to you. So I read it a different way, too. Well. So. <laughs> well, how'd you read it, Louis? <laughs> okay, we got to get all three versions here. So. Louis, how did you read that question? Um, I think it's, it's basically, she was talking about her creativity and, you know, do you force it, you know, push yourself to, to write the next section, et cetera, or, or ah. do you, you know, that, so I don't okay, know. Okay. So this is a really, this is a really great question and definitely one that I feel, um, that I can answer because I've been writing now, I would say full time for the last 20 years. And what I have found is creativity is not something a lot of people feel like it's something you have to be, you have to be inspired. You know, you're going to, you're going to sit down when you're inspired to write, but really you just have to show up. And when Mm -hmm. you show up, meaning just even at this podcast, by you showing up and recording the podcast, the stream, this channel of the universal force comes through you. So we can use that word in two different ways. Forcing it means you are sitting down and resenting doing the action. And creativity should never feel like that. And so the way to kind of get yourself around that is setting aside a specific time of day that you're going to dedicate to your creativity. For me, it's first thing in the morning. I set my alarm for usually when I'm in the middle of writing a book, which is always, <laughs> <laughs> I set my alarm for four o'clock in the morning. That doesn't mean I necessarily get up and start writing at four. I'll get up, I'll make coffee, I'll light candles in my meditation room, I'll do some stretching and I'll get myself into the zone and then I'll go to the computer. But I have a specified time of the day that I dedicate to being creative. And this becomes just a habitual way of being. It's like going to work. You know, your work expects you to show up at nine o'clock in the morning. You show up and you do the work. And so a lot of people put creativity outside of that context. But in reality, if you set that time aside for yourself and you just show up, whether you, you paint or you, you're a musician or you're a writer, whatever creative endeavor it is, You have to set aside some block of time. I am a big proponent of early morning. And I have heard many other creators say that between the hours of 3 and 5 a.m. is a high time of channeling, of tapping into what I call the higher, the higher self, what some people will call God, whatever label you want to give it. But it's for some reason, it's because you're fresh out of sleep, you're fresh out of bed, you've got that rest. And so you're not bogged down with the duties of the day, so to speak, you know, grocery shopping, paying the bills, going to work, whatever it is. And so if you can make that time for yourself and carve it out, you will not be forcing it. And let me preface this by saying some days you're going to create longer than others. Some days when I sit down to write, I may only write for 30 minutes and that, and I know it just comes to an end. I'm not inspired to do it beyond that point. Then there are moments that that 30 minutes turns into three or four hours. 
I take a break. I switch over to work and then I'm doing it at lunch and then I'm doing it at evening after I've cooked dinner. And so it just depends on the day. But if you can just set aside and I say do it first thing in the morning and it should never feel forced. Now, in the beginning, it's like training yourself. It's like waking up in the morning to go do a workout. It's the same thing. So the more you do it and the more you practice it at the same time every day is the more it's going to come naturally to you and it will not feel forced. I hope that answers that question. <laughs> well done. Yeah, very in-depth. Did you want to add, add anything from your perspective, Louie? I mean, writing isn't necessarily your thing, but creativity certainly fits in. <clears throat> uh, creativity. Uh, um, I just wanted to point out that creativity is for so many different people. Let's say you're a secretary. You need to be creative. Um, doesn't matter what your job is or what your role is. Um, everybody is, um, using a level of, of creativity and <clears throat> you know how good your art is by how people around you are feeling. <laughs> how they're and, responding to it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the more you're in alignment out there, the more you can say you're an artist. And I just wanted to give everybody a, a, an idea because I struggled with this for a long time that <clears throat> I like the idea of singing, but nobody likes my singing. Um, I like the <laughs> idea of drawing, but nobody likes my drawing. Um, <laughs> you know, and so it goes on. Uh, I was never a classic artist. Um, and then I started to realize that Jinshin was an art. It's called mm -hmm. the art of Jinshin Jitsu. It's this energy technique we use. Um, and I started to realize I was quite a master of that art. Um, and then I started realizing I was a master of an art of realigning myself from when I'm getting out of alignment. And as I got better and better at that, I started realizing that I'm carrying my art artistry around with me. <clears throat> um, and that, that I just, I just want everybody to get the feeling that, you know, it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, you are able to be an artist. Absolutely. And, creative. And yeah. Wouldn't you agree, Louie, that if you feel like you're forcing it, you're not actually in alignment with what it is you're doing? So there's this idea some people carry around, I'm supposed to be, um, you know, an illustrator or a musician. They have an idea that they, they, they wish they were doing some sort of creative craft. But if you feel like you're forcing it, you're actually not doing something that you're passionate about or really aligned with. Because if, if it feels forced, it's not something that you're actually enjoying. I think that's kind of the best way to gauge it. If it's not, if it's not coming from you naturally and feeling good, then it's not something that you really honestly should be putting your focus on. It's a good point. In fact, I would add to it that, uh, uh, she asked for the distinction between the balance between discipline and force. And I'm not even sure I'd pick between those two. Uh, but if I had to pick between those two, I'd pick it discipline as a way of saying, I'm going to sit down every day. I may not write everything or I may not, may not write every day. I may write for five seconds and say, okay, I'm done. Right. <laughs> you know, the, the discipline part is simply just applying myself to do it every day. And that to me is a good thing to do simply because even if I, you know, if I'm like Louie, I don't know how to draw to save my life. But if I really had an interest in drawing, I would sit down and draw very quietly, very secretly. I wouldn't share it with anybody for every day for a year. And right. at the end of that year, I'd be able to draw probably pretty well just because I had set the discipline of just sitting down to draw every day. Now, maybe my first day I do a stick figure and I'm done, you know, and then maybe my second day I do another stick figure. And then eventually I try to do like a face or, you know, right. a, line of a landscape or something. <laughs> and then I'm done, you know. And, you know, it just, it kind of builds on itself. And some days you're feeling really in it. And some of the days you're saying, oh, I don't feel it at all. I'm going to go do something else. Yes. It's just by going through that habit every single day, building yes. that habit up. That's going to make Discipline is definitely born from a deep desire to hone a craft. Yeah. And when you're forcing something, that means you're trying to acquire an expertise in something that you're really not that engaged with. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between the ego and the spirit, the, 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 the pull of the, the spirit of you, which is really following the path of your passion 
And then the force would be you're following the path of something that you think you should be doing. Some, mm-hmm. Something someone has said, you're very talented at this. You know, maybe let's use the um, example of a parent. And you showed an aptitude for the piano when you were younger. You took piano lessons. And they were kind of trying to enforce this discipline on you to practice every day. And you started hating it. And you really weren't all that excited about playing the piano. Maybe instead you wanted to be a rock star or a baseball player or a gardener, what a chef. It doesn't matter. So that's the difference between discipline and force. Discipline is applying yourself towards something that you love and you really have an interest and a passion for getting excellent at. You want to achieve a level of excellence for it. Force is your mind or your ego is telling you this is something you're supposed to be doing because you showed some sort of an aptitude for it at some point in your life and someone implanted in you this belief that this was going to make you a better person, that if you followed this path, now you're going to be somebody. I think that's kind of a a really good way to gauge between discipline is a wonderful tool if you're trying to become really good at something that you're passionate about. Force means you're trying to become disciplined over something you could give two flips about. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I think there's also truth to the fact that just by doing the discipline approach, you do get better at it. And as you get better at it, you become more confident about it. And it becomes become, more exciting. And that's it. When As the confidence comes, it becomes more exciting. You become more engaged, more interested. And you do that long enough. If after like, you know, I don't know, a, a couple of weeks, a month, month and a half, whatever, if you're still liking it, you've probably found a life passion. Absolutely. And that's, cool. and that's where um, the the conversation starter I sent you today, this differentiation between work and play. Mm. So when you are really passionate about something, that that line gets blurred. Mm. Yes, it's work to become a great writer and to write a novel. I have put in a lot of hours into writing a lot of books and I have Mm. yet to get an agent or a, a publisher. However, I have so much fun doing it. Yeah. And so that's another way to differentiate between work and play And I think a lot of people struggle with that because we're taught from a very young age that things that feel good and are fun are hobbies and things that don't feel good, but make the money. That's what you should be doing full time as work. Mm -hmm. And it was one of my conversation starters that I wanted, you know, to kind of present for today in honor of Labor Day is this idea that we have to do things that we don't love to make money. And it's really this ingrained belief from early childhood. I mean, that's how all schools are. The nine to five, the school system is designed to make little soldiers for Mm. the work environment. You get a break at a certain time and you work these certain amount of hours. Mm -hmm. And that's where so many people are unhappy. And maybe it's a great topic for today because you shouldn't be doing work that makes you unhappy. It's not going to lead to a fulfilled life. And it certainly isn't good for your health. It's interesting that you say that because Labor Day was originally established in this country as a way of honoring the laborers who built it. Right. And the interesting, the reason that's interesting to me is that a large chunk of that labor force did so under conditions that many of those laborers disliked intensely. Absolutely. And in fact, that was part of the impetus behind creation of Labor Day here in the U.S. as a holiday. So essentially, it has its origins in celebrating people doing work they didn't like. <laughs> I mean, it's it's really, to me, the foundational building block of of much of the unhappiness in our society currently. Now, I don't and want to when- put out there the idea that nobody who labors likes no. their work because that isn't the case at all. There no, are no, no, many no. people who have, who have honored Labor Day who love their work. Yes. I'm not saying that at all, but there are so many people yes. that from early childhood were told, I want to be a ballerina. 
<laughs> I want to be this or an astronaut. And they were told by whether it was a teacher, a parent, someone in their life mm-hmm. told them that what they wanted was unachievable and it was going to be too hard. So you better pick a different life path. And a lot of people end up doing exactly that. They even go through, they even pick a college degree, not based on what they're actually interested in, but on how much money they will make, because that's what the system is based on. And that doesn't make you a bad person because you did that. Welcome to the club. Most people have. (laughs) But the fact of the matter is, is it's changing that belief. You should love what you do. And from that, abundance will flow. I can't even say that I went to college to study my degree because it was going to make me a lot of money. I went to college to study my degree because I thought it's what I ought to do. (laughs) So it was even worse. I wasn't even going to get paid well for it. And I was going to do stuff that really wasn't a great passion of mine. It became a passion because I kept doing it over and over again. But... Initially, I did it just because, well, I think I should have a well-rounded education. That's what my guidance is. It's really grounding us from childhood. Anything you enjoy is is put in that hobby category. Mm. So many parents do this to their children. I am very proud that I did not do this with my kid. And my kid, from a very early age, I just encouraged his love of illustration I have a four-year degree from an art college, and he is a better illustrator than I am through encouraging him and telling him what an amazing artist he is, and you can do this for a career if that's what you want to do. And I, I, I love seeing parents that inspire their children to actually reach for what they want to do, not what they think, you know, they'll fit into some category that will pay them well or they could pay their bills. Now, Josie, who asked the question that you answered at the top of the show, and Josie, you posted it again, but uh, check back to the beginning of the show. You'll find that uh, Amy addressed it there. But she had a follow-up. She says, um, if it feels like work, it's not inspired action. And she quoted that from Florence Scovel Shin. Yeah. Um, but she says, I agree to an extent, but sometimes there are actions that you don't want to do, but they feel better once you've done them. What do you think of that? Louie. <laughs> <laughs> so retrospective feeling good. How does that work? So you start something and um, <clears throat> it feels like a lot of work. It feels uncomfortable. So you're knowing what you don't want, but as you persevere um now, it doesn't always happen. When, when you persevere, sometimes what can happen is you are now living out society's belief structure. The society's belief structure is this. If you work hard, study hard, you'll get good results. Right. Okay. So while you're busy working hard, you, you've got this <clears throat> society's belief structure, which is a very strong active vibration within our humanity, which is if you work hard, you know, you can get some good results. And what, what you're doing there is you're, you're working hard, you're feeling you've paid the price, and then you're letting go and releasing and feeling good about what you've achieved because you've suffered rather than having the whole process being beautiful and nice and, and glorious right from the beginning all the way through. Mm. You, you're now doing what society's very active program is getting you to do is know what you don't want, flip it to what you do want, and, and then you feel good. So, you know, sometimes when I go for a run or really hard exercise routine, and I come back and I'm lying on my bed absolutely dead, but I'm feeling good. You know, I just feel so good to have exercised the body and all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, I really appreciate that aspect. And then what I, what I started doing is I started slowing my exercise down. And I started doing it bits and pieces. And then I came across Tai Chi, which is fantastic because you can literally feel good from the moment you step into the class yes. to the moment you leave and even feel better when you leave and you, you, you didn't suffer along the way. So I started to learn that there were ways that I can do my exercise that didn't need to. And, and even in the pool, um, I often just, you know, got in and did my laps and I can't do that anymore. I get in and I swim like a dolphin and I, um, I do my twirls. So I do crawl, but I, I flip over all the time. Um, so I do 
anything that makes it exciting and interesting. And, uh, you know, when I do this dolphin thing of mine, when I'm coming down, there's, an, there's a point which is zero gravity and you just completely let go within the one or two seconds that you're there. Then you do a sharp turn and you come straight up, you stand up and you do the next dolphin. And so, you know, I'm really looking forward to that next delicious few mm. seconds of complete relaxation, letting go, gravity and this, et cetera. So, you know, I've been learning and programming my life to to have less and less of the hard, um, you know, you need to work at it hard, play hard, et cetera, aspects, and just finding ways that I can really milk every bit of it, you know, from beginning to end. Yeah, I and, really love uh, that. That's and, great. And you so slowly I... get better at that. You slowly yeah. start realizing that the only reason that you've been going through this other process of working hard and then feeling good is a program that society has believed and put into our lives in our education system, you know, work hard, study hard, and you'll get a good job, go, go, go and do it. And, you know, all the rest of it is really, it's, it's a very strong program. And it is, it, it is just based around contrast it's saying, you know, if you, if you, if you if you know what you don't want, you have a better idea what you do want. But it 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 really spends a little much too much time in my mind focusing on what you don't want, and um, you really don't have to play that game once you become aware of how to do step five more and more often. Yeah, I think the big difference is is when you work hard, and maybe it's feeling like work in that moment, but then you get it done and it feels really good, and there's that that burst of energy if that is a self feeling of gratification that is coming from a higher place if you do the the work and you're getting that feeling of gratification because someone else said hey here's your gold star <laughs> from your boss or whoever it is that you did the work for and that's why you feel good about it that is a false sense of good feeling so there's two different types of feeling good after doing a task that feels like work. There's one that it's self-fulfilled. You push yourself, you disciplined yourself, you earned that feeling and it feels amazing. And when I write a book and I'm struggling and I rewrite and I edit, there are moments it feels like work, but when I get it figured out, it's just the best, most amazing feeling. Mm -hmm. But when I'm working at my job and I do something that is incorrect and then I correct it and then I get the little gold star and I feel good about that. It's not because I actually feel good about the work that I'm doing. It's that I feel good that I pleased who I'm doing the work for. Hmm. There's a big differentiation between the two. And so it's up to each individual person to determine is, are you getting your sense of self from gratifying yourself and your own purpose and mission? Or is it from someone else validating it? I think that's a good so thing. the problem with other people validating it is if they don't validate it tomorrow and and then you, you yes. don't feel so good anymore. So mm -hmm. right. you, you're you now need constant validation yeah. for that. <clears throat> and that is draining on the other people and it's draining on you because you yeah. don't often get it. So it's a very flawed philosophy. So it is. what it's I often, exhausting. what I often do with myself is I say, you know who I'm competing against? I'm competing against my last best time, my last right. best effort, my yes. last best attempt. And, oh, I'm so much better than I was yesterday. I'm so much better than I was yesterday. And um, one thing I love, of course, I love getting sick. So the process of getting well. So it's like, <laughs> oh, I feel so much better than yesterday. Wow. I can't believe the, the absolute jump from the last time that I, you know, that I kind of looked at it. And I'm really, really enjoy that aspect. So. I actually had a moment this week where from all of the work, I thought this was going to be my week off. I was taking time off with my husband. And like I said, I signed up for something I wasn't quite ready for. And I got physically sick and it, it went on for about two days. And when I jumped back out of it, it was like, wow, this is amazing. I feel so good today. <laughs> Because it was in such direct contrast to what I was feeling. Mm. When I read Josie's phrase where she said, sometimes there are actions that you don't want to do, but feel better once you've done them. That's something that 
reverse resonated with me. <laughs> well, we love to hear this. <laughs> meaning that, that it didn't resonate with me in a way that I like. It resonated with me in a way that was very familiar, however. And the reason I say that is I did that for years. Yes. I did that for many, many years. And it has actually gotten to the point in my life where if I have something that is perhaps essential to what it is that I like doing. My, my big passion, everyone knows, is doing this podcast. You know, there may be something essential to it that I'm not looking forward to doing. If I try to force myself to sit down and do that, there is no happy outcome that comes out of that. No. It fails miserably on so many levels. It yes. really, really does. Whereas if I take the time to get myself to into a good first. feeling place, to get into alignment, and then take another look at whether I even am willing to do the task. Exactly. Or you're gonna now just all of a sudden, it, yeah. it has a different feel to it. It's Beautiful. no longer in the category of, oh, I really don't want to do that. Beautiful. Beautifully put. And I think away. today is such a great day to address this actual topic. How mm -hmm. many people are out there doing things for the gold star that they don't want to do at the end of the day, like Louie was saying, the gold star means nothing because you're going to need the next one and the next one and the next one to continue feeling good rather than picking and choosing the things that you prefer to do and then doing them to, to excellence feels amazing. And it resonates throughout your life and it just keeps lifting you to higher and higher levels. And by the way, I'll even violate all the rules, so to speak. And if a day comes where I have this task to do that I really don't want to do, and then I work to get myself into alignment, and I still don't want to do it, guess what? I don't do it. Me either. <laughs> Me either. Oh, my God. That's not allowed, is it? <laughs> not allowed if you're a boss. <laughs> even as a writer, I am really disciplined. And there are some mornings when I wake up, it doesn't matter what it is. I will not feel inspired to write and I give myself permission. It's okay. Because mm -hmm. if it's not coming from a really truly inspired place, the discipline means nothing. Nothing good is going to come out of me by forcing it. Right. Just to go back to that reiteration of that word. If it's forced, that, it, that should be your telltale sign. It is not inspired. It is not going to be your best. It's not and going to nothing be ever, Nothing good ever comes out of it. That's, the, that's no. the thing I've really learned. I mean, that's actually the nice way of putting it. Anything that comes out of it is really undesirable. <laughs> that's what yes. my experience is. It's really undesirable in a big, big way. Yeah. And I loved it when uh, Abram said, you know, when you make a decision when you're happy, it tends to turn out well. When you make a decision when you're not happy, it tends to not work out well. <laughs> And you can really start seeing that clearly in your life with very little effort. Oh, yes. That that is exactly how it works. <laughs> Annoyingly so at times, but yes. nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there have been times uh, people ha listening to the show know the stories that I've told about what it was like in the early stages of programming the app. And yes. there were days where I was just making no progress at all, and I was practically spitting fire and you know getting – Again, making no progress and then feeling miserable as a result of it. Mm. And it was just evident. It was just so completely self-evident that my attitude going into it was undermining any possibility of, of moving forward, of having progress. I have six unpublished novels in my computer because I got to a point of editing and rewriting that it wasn't fun. It wasn't inspired. Mm -hmm. It was forced mm -hmm. back to the original script said, and just publish that <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's when i said okay it's time to put this one down and wait for a new idea to come to me and start a new book mm -hmm. and this my, my seventh novel i've seen all the way through nothing about it has felt forced even the complete rewrite that i've done on it was completely inspired and it is such a distinct difference you know by how it feels you know, when you're doing something that's forced, that's exactly what it feels like. It feels like somebody's literally forcing, pushing you to walk into a room to do something that you don't want to get into. You don't want to do it. And when you're inspired, you just want to breeze right into it. It feels good. It's it's exciting. And they're just such distinct vibrations. 
You know, Amy, I came across, I'm, I'm, I'm an avid listener of um, sci-fi kind of novels on nice. Audible. So, you know, you're this Audible book, and I've been through a lot of the authors and all the rest of it. And um, I came across this new guy the other day, and I was like, God, I never heard of this guy before. And he's already published six novels. Mm. They're all in Audible. <clears throat> and I thought, let me do some history on this guy, because, you know, I'm really enjoying these novels, and... I've never heard of this guy, so let's have let, let's dig into it. As a UK guy, he was working on some arbitrary job, um, you know, no massive consequence, I suppose. You know, brought in a salary for him, and he he he, he loved listening to sci-fi. So he went and um, said, you know, there's certain things I want to change. There's a lot of things that the guys are writing that just annoy me. You know, I would do it like this. So he sat down, and started writing, and. He published it on Amazon, self-published it on Amazon. Nobody wanted to take him, take his stuff or even look at it. So he self-published. He forgot about it and a month went by and, you know, he brought, brought in about a hundred quid or something. Mm-hmm. And he thought, great. So he took his wife away on holiday, uh, with a hundred quid that he had made on Amazon. Right. And, um, then when about a month later, you know, he was on the top, top sellers list wow. and he was selling That's thousands amazing. of copies. And then, you know, he turned it into Audible and he turned it into six books and he works from home and he writes now, he doesn't do anything else. You know, he's very wealthy. He's got a, a movie option on the table already. And I was like, you know, as a guy's like 26 years old, UK guy who was That's doing great. A, an, an arbitrary job and you know he was just so shocked when he found out he was getting all these sales <laughs> and uh and it was it all started just because he was thinking you know there's certain things i would change if i wrote one of these books yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> that's how it started that's usually where it starts usually it starts and the it is a change of some kind usually yes. it happens because we change something in our day-to-day life Something we, we do something different. We yes. mix up the routine a little bit. He mixed up the routine. He decided to write this thing and put it on Amazon, and then he forgot about it, which is probably yeah. the best thing he could have done. Exactly. exactly. You just have the to let follow go. the inspired. I call it the breadcrumb trail. You know, our our higher self leaves these little breadcrumbs, and if you follow them and you trust them, and you don't think beyond it, you get led down a trail. Mm-hmm. For me, I work from home, so I've got my author life. And I also work, um, I, I manage the office of my husband's fireplace company. But before all of this started, we, we had divorced. So we've gotten back together since. When I started working for him, we were divorced and I was working as a nanny. And basically my kid required for me to be at home full time with him. And this is what got me to start working full time for my ex-husband because he was my ex-husband at the time. And there was some fear there because we had just reestablished our friendship. And I was like, this seems like a lot of pressure for me to be working for you full time suddenly. And so I had all of these fears, but because of my life circumstances, I decided to take that leap of faith and said, you know what, I'm going to do this. And there's a reason this is happening and I've never been happier. So I do have a regular job, but it's, it's like I'm already some famous published author, even though I'm not, because I work from home in my pajamas, working with my husband, so I get to be home with my kid. I don't have to deal with what so many people have to deal with out working in the workforce and getting up for that nine to five job. So it's almost like this crossover, this bridge. It's terrible getting out of your bed and going to your desk and start work. It's just, it's just so terrible. The, the, the I mean, traveling is like just so rough. The commute will get you. I mean, <laughs> so I feel really, really blessed. And here's the preface: I am not a published author, but I also understand. I do have two books, but they were published 14 years ago, so they kind of don't count. But the the thing is, is that I'm doing a job. Is it my dream job? No, but there's so much about it that I love and is keeping me in this bubble of happiness that I get to be creative. It works with my schedule. And so a lot of people that are out there right now thinking, hey, yeah, right. You know, how do I go from working this nine to five job that I hate to the dream? 
there are steps in between. So if you just follow them, because As soon as you set the intention, hey, I've got a desire for something. I want something more. I'm not really passionate about this. I'd really love to do this. The minute you claim that and set that intention, guess what? By law, universal law starts bringing in cooperative components. There you go. Oh, dear, is a technical sentence. (laughs) Yes, the cooperative components start lining up. But if you keep telling yourself, I have to do this for money to pay my mortgage and I can only do this as my hobby. Say you're a florist or you like to garden or cook or whatever it is. Any of these creative things, like Louie pointed out, anything can be creative. If you're into it, it's creative. And so it's your belief. It's your belief. Folks, if you hear anything from today, start changing that belief. You, you deserve to do what you love and also be able to support your lifestyle. There doesn't have to be this, uh, you know, division between the two. Now, in the time period that we're in right now, there's a, there's another aspect that we should bring in because here in the U S and I suspect probably also in the UK, although I haven't followed the statistics closely enough to know, but here in the U S there's currently a very high level of unemployment. And so there are a lot of people who are pretty freaked out because they don't have money coming in and right. maybe their unemployment is running out or it's running low. It's not enough to support, or maybe even yeah, out of the workforce so long, they don't have scary, any. Just wait. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would you, say we can always that... count on you for that little bubble of, of emotional support there, Louis. I love that. Okay. Well, <laughs> I would love to address this because I have a lot of friends who are in this position right now and they have never been happier because they're getting less money than what they're used to making but they're also able to pursue things that they weren't able to pursue before. Mm. And so I'm actually seeing a rise within my circle of friends where this time, even though it's very tragic and I understand a lot of people are facing hardships and I am not trying to take away from that. Use it to your advantage. You are being given a, an opportunity right now, instead of looking at it as a tragedy Look at it as an opportunity. The way our entire society is structured is being changed because of this. Places that once wouldn't allow remote working are allowing people to work from homes for the first time because they have to. And they could always do that, but they didn't want to let go of the control. So this is a time of huge opportunity. So if you find yourself in the position right now where you are out of work, you're collecting unemployment, you don't know what to do. Instead of being afraid, I want you to just wake up every morning just for five minutes and envision what would you actually love to do with your life? Forget the paycheck. Forget what's realistic and what you've been told. Just think for one minute, what would, what would, what skill set and passion do you have that you feel like would benefit our society? You can make money off of. There are people who make money off of giving people hugs online. (laughs) I'm not kidding. (laughs) Okay. So as ridiculous as that might sound that for whatever you're passionate about, there is a place for you. You just have to set that intention. And by the way, if you are unemployed to the point where you don't even have unemployment coming in, you're, you know, it's a question of whether or not you're going to be able to keep your home. A lot of people are facing that these days. It can be very difficult to say, okay, yeah, I'm going to start acting as if it's not a big deal and I'm going to focus on what I love. That, that, that could be a bit, big, pretty big transition. That so is. let's talk a little bit about how to make that pivot for somebody who is really in a tough spot. They're in a very, very tough spot and they that's need to be able I, to make that shift. They have some awareness that they have to make that shift. That's but, why I say five minutes. I'm not talking that you need to hold that thought all day. Mm-hmm. Five minutes in the morning, give yourself that just to test this theory out that we're calling the law of attraction, that the three of us that are on this podcast have proven it works, folks. I'm not kidding. I I got fired. I had no income coming in and a child to take care of. And by law of attraction, suddenly things were coming to me. I could, I can't even explain it to you. Things were being given to me. Resources were coming to me that I cannot explain. 
So if you find yourself in that position, just give yourself five minutes a day, see what you need and understand and believe that it'll come to you. I, I would even go a step further and say, give yourself the five minutes, then go out and spend the next two hours or whatever it is that you're going to spend on putting out the resume and reaching yes. out and finding the jobs and all that kind of stuff. And then you're going to have reached a point where, where there's nothing more really to be done for the day. Right. Then take the rest of the day and go back to step one. Yes. Just feel good. Feel good. Because unless you feel good, you have to understand by feeling bad, you're, it's a block. It's a shield to receiving what you're asking for. So the more you fret, I know it's hard. I know it's so hard when that bank account is low and you don't have food in the fridge and the rent needs to be paid. I get it. I've been there. Me too. So what you have, that's the trick is giving yourself the space to visualize. Like Walt said, take some action that's going to feel good to make you feel like, okay, I did what I can do today to get something good coming in. And then you have got to allow yourself to receive what you've asked for. And that may mean doing processes of various kinds. I mean, for me, a big one was doing mirror exercises just because that helped me to quiet the mind. Meditation is the traditional way to do this, the way most people do it. Um, but quieting that mind, that's a huge part of it. The reason that we keep fearing about what's going on is because that monkey mind just keeps throwing all these things at us. Well, you don't have a job. You better get a job. If you don't have a job, you're not going to be able to. For me, it's laughing. Anything, put on something funny on Netflix. You don't even need to think about what you're asking to manifest. It's getting the block to go away. So mm -hmm. raising your vibration, humor and laughter is one of the biggest ones that I've used throughout my entire journey with this. And boy, does it work because mm -hmm. it just raises my vibration. And then the next thing I know, I'm receiving something I wasn't expecting. And then that validates what we're talking about here. And mm -hmm. with each validation, that belief grows stronger. That's true. That's very true. So hopefully we are giving some hope to people who are in that position and uh, maybe even the very early kernels of a belief that it can actually change because it really can. Absolutely. But I don't know about you, Amy, and, and Louie, you could chime in on this too, but I have had a few instances in my life where I thought basically I had my back against the wall. Like there was nothing left to be done. I, I felt adrift. I felt like I was completely out of control. And <laughs> that's where I finally let go because I didn't know what else to do. You know, there was nothing else to be done. I, I, it was just everywhere I looked was just a blank wall that could lead nowhere. It was just that kind of a harsh reality. And yet, Somehow, something always came through. Not necessarily a job, per se, but something came through that just started some new pattern. And a new pattern that led to somehow climbing a out of this mess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the thing that's pretty strange about it. If Unless you've been in that space for a long, long time, that unemployed, beaten up space, which is possible. There are a very small percentage of people who have been in that place. But unless you've been in that place for a long period of time, you had enough vibration going in your not so good time leading up to it that led that, that still leads to stuff coming through. All you have to do is just let go of all that angst and it starts coming through. You don't have to be in the perfect high vibe place. That's the point. It doesn't, you don't have to be perfect about it. You just have to let it through a little bit. Yes. <laughs> and then stuff, stuff starts. To, now, I'm not saying that it's a bad idea to be in the high vibe place. Stuff comes through a whole lot better when you're in the high vibe place. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying you don't have to pivot 180 degrees all at once. You can go two degrees and then two more degrees and another three degrees and just keep, you know, inching your way over there and it works. I mean, Louis, that's not something that Abraham talks about very much, is it? Although the pivoting process can be used in that way. Um, but I think Abraham talks about it all the time. The, you know, you can't get from there to there. <clears throat> the diff, the, I mean, the, the incremental thing, the, the little tiny steps. That's they, Do they talk about the little tiny steps? Well, in, in the sense that they're trying to point it out, you can't go from a problem vibration to solution vibration because they're different vibrations you're not going to be attracting the right thing so you know then they brought in the emotional guidance scale which teaches you right. to go 
up the scale, etc. So to me, Abram's talking about it all the time, um, just maybe in a different way. But mm-hmm. um, okay, to me, to me, it's very, very clear that they're always talking about you can't jump vibration um, very quickly or easily. So go up step by step or incrementally. Um, and I think that's uh, an absolute key aspect of LOA. It's, you know, without it, um, a lot of things don't make sense. <clears throat> Agree. Um, so there was this um, lady, I think uh, Amy didn't hear the story, but um, somebody was saying that they found um, this guy, He's got this whole thing about clouds and he loves clouds and you can join his group and it costs 25 pounds and all the rest of it. And she saw how many people were members and all the rest of it. And she was like, started to realize that um, I think I mentioned this last time, but I, I know Amy didn't hear. So, you know, this guy was making an absolute fortune. You know, you can, you can buy the 50 pound one or the, or the 25 pound one. And you can submit your photos and he'll put them up on his website of clouds. And that's all he was doing. And he had a passion for clouds. <laughs> and, um, you know, I said to, you know, the reason why he's made so much money is, and, and I said, you, you probably will even feel it quite easily is, is that he, he has a passion for clouds. He truly enjoys and loves clouds. Uh, you know, I haven't even seen the site or anything, but I'm guessing, and she, she, she verified it for me that this guy really does have a passion for it. And I said, that's why the money comes easily. Right. He's doing what he loves. Yes. He's found a little platform that he can share it and uh, make some money out of it at the same time. And it is just so simple. I mean, giving hugs, that was another one, just blew me away. Giving hugs yeah. on, <laughs> on Skype. There are professional huggers. It's a job where people Well, well I've actually been to, 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 <laughs> to, to, to the guru um, mummy hugger or whatever they call her. Um, you know, she comes to London and you, you sit in a queue for hours going forward and forward and then you get in front of her and she gives you a hug and, you know, she goes around the world hugging people. That's her life. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, quite a service. You, you could hear <laughs> in the background. I mean, to me, it did absolutely nothing to people around me. They were crying and all the rest of it, but you know, everybody's got their own expectation and they create their own reality and, this was not ex- something that particularly excited me being the more intellectual type. This huggy thing was just, right. you know, okay. Something, something to play with at the time. <laughs> um, um, so, you know, I, I wasn't really expecting much for myself and I didn't get it. So, you know, it all worked out. <laughs> you got what you, you got exactly law, what you expected. Law of attraction was all working correctly, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, but you know, some of the people were absolutely, um, in, in tears of, of just letting go, you know, just absolutely. They needed go. that. That, that was something that they sought out that. and needed yeah. it. Yeah. And they used her as a trigger to release it. And I thought that was great, you know, absolutely beautiful. And, you know, uh, what a, a job to do for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, the fascinating thing is I was sitting there watching her and um, the, the conversation, although it was in Indian, <clears throat> between her and her people around her, was like they were they were like talking about oh, what we're going to buy tomorrow and what we're going to wear and how we're going to do this and you know and I was like okay <laughs> <laughs> nothing spiritual about this at all <laughs> from oh one goodness. perspective you know and from another perspective you know they were just being themselves they were being honest and they were just doing what they were or what, you know where they were at and I just loved it I think the whole thing was quite an enlightening you know experience for me but maybe not in a way some people some other people would need it or used it but to me it was very very enlightening i i've maintained for quite some time that there is a demand for that kind of love and it's a financial a, a demand that can be that, that can pay money that can be a financial uh reward because there is so much need to feel good yeah people don't necessarily realize it i think that's part of what's going on right now is it's sort of like this global <clears throat> wake up you know, okay, we really need to be paying more attention to feeling good. Now, is that the way people are receiving it? Probably not in most cases. But nevertheless, it's what they're feeling. They may not have identified it, but I think they're really feeling it. So that's what she was tapping into. It's it's interesting. So many of the people I'm intersecting with, whether it's at the grocery store, the gas station, people I do not know, mm-hmm. all seem to be sharing a very similar outlook on what's happening right now. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's law of attraction at its finest. I just keep intersecting with people 
that are seeing this as a global shift and as scary as it can be. And I understand there are, there are people that are in situations that it, it is scary and it is unnerving and unsettling. I get it. I feel very fortunate that for me, not much has changed. I'm in, I'm in my own reality bubble, I call it. And I would say that's probably because, you know, I'm years ahead of the curve on holding my own reality. And so I've been very careful also, uh, exposing myself to the media and everything that's going on in the fighting and the politics. And even I'm aware of what's <clears throat> happening. And yet I'm looking at it as though there's a, it's through a, it's through like the, almost this clear wall. Mm-hmm. So I'm observing it, but I'm not actually participating in it. But as your dear friend said on, 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 on the group the other day, but you're a nihilist and I hate nihilists. Those were his words. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. The, okay. You so remember that? that. Is a yes. great, okay. I would love, let's segue into that. And there is Gizmo. I've been wondering where he was going to be <laughs> during, wait, I got to point this way during this call because he appears in every single one and he waited till the end on this one. Mm-hmm. So yes, that's very interesting that you bring that up, Louie, because there are people that have a belief. I didn't even know what a nihilist is. I needed to ask Walt. <laughs> we had a long conversation. People believe that, yeah. that if you believe in the law of attraction, then immediately that means that you think that people that have been done wrong and that have been hurt, that they have created that reality for themselves. And that means you are somehow some sort of a monster, basically. And, um, well. Yeah, it's only, terrible. I'm having a nice life. It's I, just the worst. You know, ever. the only Game response over. I have to say to that is, you don't get it. Sorry. <laughs> but it'd be interesting to break it down for the individual. And you'd say something like, okay, so define nihilist again, uh, Walt, just from your clarity there. You had quite a good clarity. I always have trouble. I, I, I studied it and I still have trouble just defining what <laughs> it is. A nihilist is essentially somebody who says that nothing matters. That's the best definition I can give you. Okay, so basically, you don't you don't care about what's going on in other people's lives. You know, you live in right. this world, and you know Joe Bloggs are suffering over there, so you don't care about them. So, you know, the one thing that Abram really threw at me, and it, and it was a huge light bulb moment because it is a biggie. Is Abram was saying, what's the greatest gift you can give anybody else? And it was really confusing. I sat there. For ages thinking, I, I don't know, you know, kindness, you know, and there was hundreds of things coming up. And then Abram says, no, the greatest gift that you can give anybody else is your own happiness. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Wow. How does that work? That, that's so profound. And, I, you know, I had to sit there and break this whole thing down. So, in other words, because, because I'm caring about myself first. That's the most important thing. And then if I keep my vibration high, then I'm tapping into source energy. And because I'm tapping into source energy, that filters out from me to everybody else around me. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. That is so powerful. So I can be a narcissist and it's good for me. My God. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's funny. (laughs) It was very enlightening. It was a complete turnaround in my whole thinking, you know. Tending they, they your own vibration is 100% the biggest gift that you can give to yourself and therefore everyone around you. And those. And it's interesting. Days, that is so true, but you really have to think about it for a while before it, all the pieces of yes. that fall into place and you can accept it and start living it, you know. That's why I don't even argue, um, on that thread that Will, Walt is talking about. I didn't even argue with it because. Unless you understand what we're talking about here, there's no point in arguing with that. It's I'm not going to allow it to bring my own vibration down. You either understand it or you don't. And if you want to understand it, well, there's lots of research out there that can help you to understand it. By the way, I wanted to put, throw in a clarification, a point of clarification, because um, we, we made a joke out of it, but it's also a, a serious side. Um, the word narcissist 
it's it's been kind of uh, flung around a lot lately in conversations, particularly here in the U.S. because we have a president that a lot of people apply that label to. Mm. And the point of confusion, I think, comes down to this. A lot of people associate narcissism with looking out for yourself, and they're not necessarily the same thing. Louis, no. you actually indirectly identify what the difference was because in your story, you talked about how well, Abraham had thrown this challenge out. You know, what, what, what's the best thing you can give to somebody else? By asking that question, you define yourself as not being a narcissist because a narcissist doesn't care about anybody else. Mm. Just by saying, well, what, what can I be doing to give to somebody else? You are expressing I'm not a narcissist. That's right. Even though you spend perhaps, you know, 99% of your time focused on what's good for you. The fact is you do care about other people. You do have an interest in other people, you know, having a better life. That makes you not a narcissist. And that's the difference. Yeah. You understand that by caring for yourself, you're caring for the whole. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. The narcissist doesn't give a crap about anybody else. Nope. <laughs> no interest in them at all. They'll make a lot of sounds like they do, but <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> Just they do not care about anyone else. <laughs> I don't know if I've really come across a narcissist. I know some people <clears throat> call bosses and all other people narcissists, but I don't know if I've come across a true narcissist myself. I don't know. I don't, maybe I have, maybe I haven't, but it, it's, it's not something that kind of resonates with me. You know, the, the real bad definition of the word narcissist. Um, I don't know if I've come across those kind of individuals who are just so self-absorbed that, you know, nobody else means anything to anybody. Um, well, if you look at them closely, you'll see that, that they do care. There, there, there are <laughs> narcissists who are really good at mirroring and mimicking what they've heard they should be saying. The only way you really find out that they're a narcissist is when you find out they didn't, re they never really meant it in the first place. And that can be hard to do. So very often you may have run into a narcissist and not known it. <laughs> Just yeah. because you didn't hear anything. That, that gave you the clue, you know? So but, it's but again, hard. so when, when I look at somebody, I'm looking for their source energy, for the, for, for who they really are. I'm not mm -hmm. looking at an outer for garb. That label, so, right. so even the narcissist that some people might label an individual who's quite clearly fits the profile. Um, I will not be looking at that. And as I'm not looking at that, that is not what they're going to be landing up bringing out to me. So they might bring sure. their narcissist tendencies out to Joe blogs, but I might, you know, I often say to people, I never see that in an individual. Where, where do you see that from? Where's mm -hmm. it coming from? And then suddenly, mm -hmm. of course, their vibration is reflected on that person. And they, bring I really out like that, that outlook, Louie. Well done, sir. <laughs> it it, 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 it oh, raises you. a great point because this is the strangest part about it, um, about the narcissistic uh, phenomenon. And that is narcissists are just as, I'll say, fluid as many people are who don't have the discipline and experience with what we know here. They, they have not taken the time to develop themselves. So right. they can shift in and out of it and not know the difference. Right. Because they've, they've never looked at that side. So this has been a great topic, and I'm glad that we were discussing it. Thanks so much for your input, guys. I want to remind everybody that uh, you want to download the LOA Today app because that's how you can send questions in to Louie and to Amy and Cindy and the stream and, and to Alex and Daniel and Linda and Rita and, and to myself even. Anybody you want to send a question to to have us address it on the show because look at what happens when we do this. This has been a great show because of it. So make sure that if you have not done so that you download and install the LOA Today app and of course to tell a friend to tell a friend because we want to share the app with as many people as possible. Thank you Louie. Thank you Amy. Thank you to our live streamers. Thanks Josie for your question. Thanks especially to our podcast listeners as well. We'll see you all next time here on on LOA today. Goodbye, everybody.